Uh, good morning, everyone. We are happy to see you all. Uh, on behalf of uh, Asher Sustainability Center and our pan partners in the Green Network, we are very pleased to host Rachel Musson, CEO and founder of Flotbox uh, Education. Good morning, dear Rachel. Good morning. <laughs> I want to share with all of you that Rachel and I have met several times in the past year, and each meeting is inspiring and very energizing. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel Musson is an uh, international speaker, educator, facilitator, RSA fellow, and a thought leader on regenerative education and well being in schools. Using her uh, insight as a secondary school teacher and curriculum designer with over 20 years' experience in education for sustainability, Rachel set up Thoughtbox Education, a social enterprise offering a whole school uh, approach. Uh, to sustainable futures, with programs currently being used by over 5,000 educators in 74 countries. Rachel is currently working uh, with global industry leaders and education uh, ministers on education reform policy. She's hosting student workshops and empowering educators and leaders through personal, professional, and organizational development training. Thank you very much, Rachel, for agreeing to meet with us today and share with us your thoughts on pedagogy in the era of climate change. The webinar is being recorded. If you want to have live English subtitles, click on the live transcript. Later on, we will edit Hebrew subtitles and make it accessible afterwards. And here I'm handing you the microphone, Rachel. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, and welcome um, to, to you all. It's a real delight to be here with you. Um, I would always prefer to be with you in person, but this is the second best thing. So um, thank you for welcoming me and hosting me. And also thank you for, for being here for these conversations. Um, I, I meet a lot of people um, in different parts of the world, and I'm always so grateful when people turn up and are ready to talk about these issues. Um, and so I'm, I'm already feeling gratitude that we can have this conversation this morning and we can explore these ideas together. And um, what we're going to do, we're going to um, have this time together. I'm going to be talking a little bit more than I usually would for the, for the first part um, so that we have a recording that um, is, is viewable for someone who's not live. But I'm going to be asking you to interact a little bit via the chat box. So I'm, I'm hoping you're all familiar with where that is. But if not, at the bottom of your screen, there's a little box called chat and I'll be asking just a few responses as we go so please do share in that box and then after maybe half an hour or so we're going to go into breakout groups and have some discussions about some of the ideas that we've been exploring um, so please if you have any questions as we go feel free to put them in the chat box or we can save them for the very end when we finish the recording and um, whatever feels best for you so I'm going to share my screen and Rachel, I would just let, like you to tell me if it works so that I know I'm, uh, I'm visible in what I'm showing. Um, I can yes, see we can see. Thumbs up. Perfect. Okay. So what we're going to be exploring uh, this morning is um, education for sustainability, or, or if you like, really education in the time of a planetary emergency. I've been very inspired by the questions that Sacco and David and all of you at Heschel have been exploring which is not necessarily just how can we teach about climate change. It's a little bit deeper. It's a little bit more reflective of what sort of education do we need in this era? And what does that look like? So I'm going to be exploring with you some of the reasons why teaching about climate change is not necessarily a quick thing. But teaching or creating education for a planetary emergency is actually a very vitalizing thing. Um, so I'm really welcoming all of your wisdom and experience into this conversation and recognize that so much of this work, you know, you have the answers, you have the tools, you have the wisdom. We just sometimes need to come together to remind ourselves of, of how to do this. So let's have a look at what we're going to explore together this morning. Um, so I would like to sort of think firstly about why we can't just teach climate change. Now, I sometimes call myself an inconvenient woman because I go to a lot of conferences where we're talking about climate education. And I, I start with the fact that climate education is not just a quick lesson that you can put into a timetable in between French math lesson and maths lesson. It's something a lot more than that. 
Um, and one of the reasons we can't just teach climate change is because climate change is not a separate issue from everything else that is happening in the world. So when we look at our financial system, our food system, our social systems, our health systems, our mental health and well-being, these are all interconnected into the climate and planetary emergency. The second part of this session, we're going to think about what a whole school approach might look like. And I'm really calling on two elements of wisdom to support us in this work. One is uh, neuroscience and the, the cutting edge research into how the human brain works. And the other is nature's wisdom, the, the ancient wisdom of the planet that we live on. And what we're finding in all of the research is that these two are just saying the same thing. They're just speaking in different languages. So how can we use that, that wisdom to look at what a whole school approach might be? And how do we start? So one of the things I'm really keen on is, is, is starting with visionary, but coming right back to earth with practical because it's important to look at the big picture. And I very much encourage us to look at the big picture and be brave to, to step back and look at why things need to be expanded and then come right back down to earth and think about, okay, how do we start? What have we already got going? What can we move into as we go forward? So that's the, the aim of this morning. Not, not much, we're gonna try and get through in the next half an hour or so, 40 minutes or so. This is a question I ask everybody in every session I work, and I welcome you to, if you're happy, to write your answers in the chat box. If you're watching this uh, at, at home, you can just reflect on this, um, or you can just reflect on it or, or speak to someone in the room if you're with someone at home. Two questions. I invite you to think about what breaks your heart about the world, and also, what gives you hope about the world? And the first question might seem a miserable question to begin this session with, but it's important that we look at the misery. We look at the bits that aren't working so that we can move through them to actually create a more beautiful future. So I invite you either to take a moment uh, on your own to reflect, or if you would like to share your thoughts in the chat box, Let's just have a moment of, of reflecting on these two questions. What breaks your heart about the world and what gives you hope about the world? So I'm just gonna pause for probably 30 seconds. Okay, so we have animal suffering, use of disposable goods and inequality, heartbreak when someone mistreats another without knowing them. Um, human nature and human nature. I like that as a heartbreak and a hope. Thank you. Um, uh, it breaks my heart to see inequality. It breaks my heart. The narrow-minded, short-sighted, greedy approach of humanity is destroying our home and that of our children. Hope is a kind gesture. It breaks my heart with people who are ignorant. Again, we've got humans and humans as hope and heartbreak. It gives me hope to see people helping each other. Uh, the injustice, the inequality, and then the open-mindedness and the activists. Again, inequality, communities coming up with hope. Just have a few more seconds if any more are coming in. Again, inequality. Acting together gives us hope. The carelessness of governments breaks our heart. Suzanne, don't, don't feel much hope. Despair, disrespect, disrespect, disrespect and contempt, willingness to contribute and help gives us hope. We've known about climate change for 50 years, but did little about it. It was a huge heartbreak. Lack of empathy is a heartbreak. I'm going to pause there and, and please feel free to keep sharing in the chat. And I just want to just share my, um, there's a word in Swahili I use a lot. I, I lived in Tanzania for many years, which is pole. And pole is uh, almost like I hear you and I feel you. So I just want to give you all my pole um, because I share these feelings and, and I share the depth of our despair and I share the grief and I share the frustration and the anger and the heartbreak. 
And I share the joy and I share the hope and I share the energy and I share the vitality and I share the um, the potential of what can come and what will come if we come together in this space. And I recognize that both of those are in me all the time. And maybe they're in you as well, this heartbreak and this hope. And I often call it the, the, the roller coaster of the climate crisis. We can have some days we wake up and we're really motivated and some days we wake up and we're full of despair. And that's very human. So just take a moment to actually give yourself some poly um, and also to give yourself some appreciation that, that how you're feeling is a very healthy feeling. Okay. Right now, across the world, we are seeing symptoms of ill health. And no matter where we look, no matter whether we look probably in our homes, in our communities, in our towns, in our countries, on a global scale, these symptoms are there for us to see. We're seeing symptoms because we are not healthy. So we do a lot of work in my organization, Thoughtbox, on helping people to learn to be a system thinker and to understand how systems work. And all of us are living in systems. We are systems. We're part of systems. And the way that systems are designed to work is to be relational, for parts of systems to connect to each other, and for these to be in a healthy balance together. And we start to see symptoms of ill health in systems when the relationships fall apart, when parts of those systems stop being healthy and therefore we have system collapse. And we're seeing this across the world. We're seeing symptoms globally of ill health through um, a rapid rise in mental health disorder, dysfunction, shutdown, anxiety, overwhelm. All of us are facing it as well as, as the people around us. And there's different levels of mental health um, issues that we're facing. But it's a huge pandemic sort of following in the face of the COVID pandemic. We're seeing ever increasing levels of inequality and fragmentation across our social systems. And many of you there just shared the heartbreak being these huge levels of inequality. And we're seeing a growing climate emergency. Now, these are meta symptoms, and we would all be later on in our breakout rooms looking at what are the smaller symptoms of some of these examples of these. But I've just given you three pictures at the bottom. I can I can look at mobile phones and social media as being one of the leading causes as a mental health crisis that we're facing in this disconnection crisis, as well as a very positive tool in our lives. We're seeing another civil war breaking out. We're seeing huge levels of unrest in our streets and high levels of protest. We're seeing mass uh, storms, fires, wildfires. We just had in the UK, the highest temperature ever recorded yesterday in our history of 40.2 degrees. Um, and we had wildfires breaking out in, in the center of London. So we're seeing wherever we look, these symptoms. It's really hard to look at them and I really appreciate all of you being here with me for the next while looking at them together, because this is the work. It begins with looking and then moving through the heartbreak. So we're seeing at the moment that we, are, we have moved beyond healthy limits, healthy balance. And we're living in this state of what's called an imbalance, personally, socially and ecologically. Now, we look in all of the work we do in this space at these three core levels. And I've done a lot of study with many, many people over the last 20 years. And every element of study we look at comes back to these three levels that all of us are living constantly in relationships with these three areas, with ourselves, with society and with the natural world. And those are the three core areas of our relationality in the world. And I'm one of those women that really wants to understand why are we in such a mess? So I've dedicated the last 10 years to really understanding how did we get here? Where did we go wrong? And what can we do to create a healthier world? So very, very briefly in one slide, the human history of, of how we ended up in this mess. Um, and I can share a lot of reading with any of you who are interested. What's happened over time, in particular since the Industrial Revolution, is we have gradually disconnected for various reasons, for many, many reasons. And we've disconnected from ourselves and our sense of physical, mental, emotional, spiritual well-being. We've disconnected from each other 
leading to this them and us scenario, this better, worse, this richer, poorer um, scenario of inequality. And we've disconnected hugely from being a part of the natural world. And we live with our doors closed, we live separate from, and we're extracting, polluting, damaging the world that we are part of. And what we're seeing now across the world are symptoms of this chronic disconnection. We're seeing the symptoms of disconnection from ourselves, from each other, and from the natural world. And we can see them in ourselves, in our own lives. We can see them in our families, in our communities, in our schools, in our countries, in our cultures, and on a global scale. And that's a really miserable statement I've just made. It's a really, really harsh reality that we're facing. And yet, facing it is the first part of moving through this into creating a thriving future. We need to look at the mess before we clean it up. I really like this image. And this image has been going around for 20 years now. But this image is coming back to, uh, to popularity because it really helps us to see almost how we've gone wrong. Um, we are living in an ego society and that doesn't work because it's not how natural systems are designed. Natural systems are designed to be in relationship with everything else around them. It doesn't work to live in hierarchy. Now, what I love so much about this work and what I love so much about the solutions to all of the crises that we're in is that we know them, we have them, and that once upon a time, we live them. So the solutions moving forward are not something new. They're something that every human being has within their DNA. And there are many, many ways we can relearn how to live and thrive together. And when we're thinking about education, one of the joys I find is that Children haven't spent as much time forgetting. They're a lot younger and they have a lot more memory in them of how to live more relationally. Now, young children, when they're born and up until the age of normally five, six, when they go to school, live in a very connected way. Children are very connected to their sense of emotions, their sense of spirituality, their sense of self. They're very good at articulating how they feel. Children are very, very deeply empathic and connected to each other and to other people around them. Children don't see difference. They don't see um, better, worse, us and them, black and white. They do not see that, that, that um, differentiation. And children are innately connected to the natural world. Little children are born curious about the soil and the earth and the trees and the butterflies. And what happens, sadly, is we teach them out of that sense of connection. It happens not consciously, but it happens through our social systems. It happens through our education systems. And it happens through our global narratives of success. And so what gives me such joy working with education is that we can just teach children to never forget. We can allow them to always remain in this space of deep connection. And those who have started to forget they haven't been forgetting for very long, so we can remind them quite quickly of what it feels like to be in that space of connection. Now, we have spent 95% of human history living in the picture on the right, living in this sense of connection. And if any of you have come across a concept called deep time, deep time is a really powerful way to understand how the ego world is very, very brief in terms of history. Um, and actually, we can shift out of it again very quickly. And I can share lots of resources at the end of this. If anything I mentioned you want to learn more of or, or have resources on, do let me know. So I want to slow us down a little bit because we've just, we've just started the morning looking at the global systemic issues of the entire planet. And that's quite heavy. And actually, we really need to be talking a lot more about education. But before we start going back down to earth, I'm going to invite us to slow down. And I really love this quote from Bayo Akamalafe, where he says, these times are urgent. Let us slow down. There is a feeling, I'm sure, in all of us, and I get it a lot, of panic. You know, yesterday we had in the UK this breaking news of this, this, this high heat and I went into a sense of panic of, oh, my goodness, we've got to tell more and more people about this. We've got to do this and do this and do this. And then recognize, no, 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 this is a time for wisdom. 
not for reaction. Because this, this time, we do not want us to just put the fire out. We want to understand why the fire started in the first place. Yes, we need the firefighting, but we need us to step back and be wise and understand the root cause of what's going on, because we'll just keep having fires that we have to keep putting out. So this invitation to slow down isn't standing back and doing nothing. It's actually standing back and looking at the bigger picture, taking a look at what the systemic issues are and starting to focus on fixing or responding to the bigger root cause. Now, I like the work of a, a man called David Suzuki, who looks a lot at the ecological crisis as being a spiritual crisis with children, well, with many of us. And when we talk about disconnection in our schools, I, I just like this quote. I think it's a really important one to recognize. He says, unless we are willing to encourage children to reconnect with and appreciate the natural world, we cannot expect them to help protect and care for it. And what we're going to be looking at this morning and what the work we've been doing now at Thoughtbox for quite a while is focused on is creating a culture of care in schools, a culture of care, care for ourselves, care for each other and care for the natural world. Because if we're not teaching children to understand why they should care, they're not going to. And so part of this work is helping them to reconnect with themselves, each other and the planet, to then know, oh, I really want to care for those butterflies, those rivers, those forests, those ecosystems, because I love them and I, I need them and I want them in my life. So care and connection are two vital words that I really wish you to hold in this session. So I'm hoping you're already starting to feel into why we can't just quickly teach climate change, but just to name it with you a little bit. We can't just teach climate change because these issues are emotional, they're painful, and they're very overwhelming sometimes. They're complex and they're intersectional. They require reflection and discussion and they welcome knowledge, skills, and behaviors, not just information. Now, one of the, the um, difficult parts of this work, but the very beautiful parts of this work, is inviting emotion into the discussion. Now, we've worked a lot alongside an organization called the Climate Psychology um, uh, Association. And there is a, a collection of psychologists, child psychologists, and mental health practitioners working in this field of education to help to understand how to talk to children about the climate crisis. And I've got another free training video that I can share with you that, that, that talks through a little bit of this in more detail. But the situation that they really share is that if you just give children information about climate change, about fossil fuels, about ecological collapse, what you're doing is you're feeding them horror with no space for reflection, no space for sharing how that makes them feel, no space for processing, no space for thinking and questioning and sharing some of the thoughts and feelings, and no space for empowerment. Now, if I'd started this morning just asking you what breaks your heart, and I hadn't mentioned the word hope, already you'd be sitting in this session feeling quite bleak. But because I already brought in this idea of hope, and we're bringing in our emotional landscape, we're recognizing that as human beings, we feel when we hear a lot of this information. And so part of the process of talking to children about the climate crisis involves welcoming the thoughts and the feelings and helping them to see that it's very human to feel scared and very human to feel activated, sometimes in the same moment. And that we as adults feel scared too, but we also can share so much of the stories of the people who are doing something to change and to create healthier worlds. And we're gonna look shortly at how to help create this active hope with young people. The problem with just teaching facts is we can very quickly become desensitized. We can hear information and I hear it a lot on the news and I hear it in our politics, I hear it in our governance reading out statistics about biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse, as though they're reading a shopping list, as though that doesn't deeply, deeply hurt our soul. 
And what happens if we just focus on the facts is we become desensitized and we don't let it in. We don't let it hurt. We don't let it make us fearful. We just keep it on the surface. And I feel that's quite dangerous because then it's not allowing us to stand up in our human sense and respond and act and call for action. And our potential to care becomes diluted because we don't let it in. So again, if we were if we were together, I would be asking us to physically move right now into different corners of the room. Um, but we're not together, so we're just on Zoom at the moment. So I would just like you to share in the chat some words about how you are feeling right in this moment about the climate crisis. And I've just given a couple of words. And what we would do perhaps if we were doing this live is we would have four corners in the room and you stand somewhere in that spectrum of where you're feeling right now, recognizing that you might be sort of moving between a couple of those areas. But just share a couple of words that you're feeling right now in the chat box. And if you're not watching this, if you're not with us live, you can just take a moment at home to just reflect on how you're feeling in this moment. And all, mo all feelings are very, very welcome. So if you just share, share in the chat a couple of words about how you're feeling right now about the climate crisis. Frustrated, we're going to be moving along the edge of the slide. We're confused, uh, humble, humid. Um, a challenge to adapt to change. We're angry, we're frustrated, we're overwhelmed, we're anxious, we're also driven, we're powerless, we're depressed. We feel there's opportunities. We're motivated. We're angry, we're motivated. Okay, we'll just have a couple more. Forgive me, but my Hebrew is not good. I can't uh, translate that word. We're motivated. Um, we're willing to dedicate it a lot to improve adaptation. We're motivated, we're facing huge challenges. We're worried, we're powerless. We're motivated. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And again, thank you for opening up. It's a little bit like cracking our hearts open in these moments. And I hope you also look at some of those words and recognize that you felt that yesterday, or you'll feel it tomorrow, or you'll feel it in 10 minutes. This is a, a roller coaster. This is a moving landscape. Some days I wake up and I'm ready to take on the entire government of the world. And some days I just put the cover back over my head. But what I do know is I can choose to feed some of those feelings and I can choose to fuel some of those feelings. One of the things I've discovered in my days, if I wake up and the first thing I do is read the news, I feel negative feelings. If the first thing I do when I wake up is go and sit in the garden and drink my coffee, I feel joy, I feel connection, I feel energized, and I understand what this is all about. And that habit change for me has been life changing. I read the news later on, but I start the day strengthening my deep, deep love of the natural world. I also recommend reading something called Positive News. It's an app that shares the stories of people across the world who are doing amazing things to respond to the climate crisis. When you start the day reading that, the whole nervous system is responding in a very positive way, as opposed to reading all of the symptoms, because mainstream news in most countries is just a list of those symptoms that we looked at at the very beginning of this session, the symptoms of disconnect, mental health, social inequality, an ever raging climate crisis. And once we know enough of the patterns to recognize those symptoms keep coming, reading more and more of them doesn't do anything. It just perpetuates the appreciation that we've got to look at the root cause. So think about how you help yourself with the emotions that you're feeling to step into those empowered emotions rather than languish in the frustration and the overwhelm. Anger is powerful and anger is sometimes very useful, but think about whether you're feeding it, or whether you're supporting yourself with a healthy balance. 
Now, we feel different emotions at different times. And a young woman that we work with a lot called Clover Hogan, who I'm going to introduce you to shortly, she calls climate anxiety an emotional smoothie. I love that because it's like everything is in there. And sometimes it's all blended up inside us and we feel all of those emotions. But we feel different emotions at different times. And as educators or as people working with young people, we do not need to fix those emotions. We might think, oh, gosh, a child has come into my school or into my um, family and they said that they're really scared. I need to fix that. We don't need to fix it. We just need to hear it and we need to acknowledge it. So thank you for sharing how scared you are. You know, I feel that, too. That's it. That's enough because you're giving that child recognition that 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 emotion is healthy and that you have it too and that actually feeling something about climate change is really natural we feel anxious overwhelmed angry frustrated because we care what would worry me the most is if I asked you how you're feeling and you said "Mm, I feel nothing there's a worrying sign when we stop feeling anything we've gone into that numb space which is also a place that a lot of people are going into because the nervous system is literally shutting down there's nothing left because of the overwhelm so celebrate if you like the feelings because they're showing us how much we care and want to do something and what we really need to do is help young people to take those feelings and turn them into action and that's really what we're going to be looking at in this in this process in this whole school approach So eco-anxiety has been termed as heightened mental, physical or emotional distress in response to changes in the climate. It's been coined that by the American Psychological Association. Now, as I said, we work a lot with the Climate Psychology Alliance and one of their leading psychologists called Caroline Hickman has rephrased eco-anxiety as eco-empathy. And I love this. Anxiety is a very inward facing word. It's a word that doesn't give us any action. It it shuts us down, it eats us up. Whereas empathy is an outward facing emotion. We feel because we care. And so talking about eco-anxiety, I I, I recommend we don't do that. We talk about eco-empathy and actually recognize that eco-empathy is a powerful feeling we can do something with. But I'm gonna share a very miserable statement and I'm, I'm, Sorry, but I'm not sorry to share this. So Clover Hogan is a 21 year old climate activist who's grown up in the climate emergency and she works with young people to support eco-anxiety. And she did a very, very good TED talk, which I will share a link with Saka so you can look at this later. She says, young people have not created this reality. We have inherited it. And yet we are told that we are the last generation to with the chance to save the fate of humanity. Now let's just take a moment to think about how would that feel if you have been given that sort of burden? It's not surprising that young people are protesting on the streets or young people are checking out and saying, you know what, big big people, adults, it's your issue, you made this mess, don't give it to us to clean up. So let's just recognize that it's not the young people's chance to fix this it's all of us we're all in this together they have a lot of wisdom and they have a lot of energy but we have the capacity to support and work with them so recognize that it's not our role to put all of this onto the next generation I'm going to be miserable again for one more minute and then I promise we're going to start moving into this process of hope this process of care this this framework for regeneration So just last, no, just this year, early this year, 10,000 young people aged between 16 and 25 from 10 countries around the world were surveyed um, about their thoughts and feelings about the climate crisis. And the the survey showed us that 75% of these young people thought the future was frightening. 84% are very worried about climate change. And 45% say that climate anxiety and distress is affecting their daily lives now these figures when I read them I can read them like a shopping list and I cannot let them in or I can actually look at that and think oh my goodness what are we doing what sort of world are we creating for our children let's put that handbrake on let's slow down and let's rethink what we're doing and let's reassess what what life is all about 
because to be born into the world and to, 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 to live in that space, that's not what life is. We're not born to, to live in that state. We're born to thrive. And so let's stop surviving in this miserable space of disconnection. Let's look at how we can start to recreate cultures of care, cultures of thriving. So maybe take a moment just to think about those statistics and what do you recognize in any young people that you're working with, any children in schools, if you're working in schools, anyone in your family that you know of. Now, I, I use a lot in the work of, of my own practice and the work at Thoughtbox, uh, the work of a woman called Joanna Macy. And Joanna Macy is a Buddhist teacher and she is an incredible wise woman. And she's got lots of free online courses. Um, and, and the work that reconnects is a very powerful course that, that you can take. Um, there's a free course. There's also a book called Active Hope, which I highly recommend. But Joanna talks about the three stories of our time. And I just want to spend a little bit of moments with you on this slide. It, it reflects a little bit of what I was saying about how I start my day and how I help to feed my energy. There are three stories happening in our lives right now, and we will all be part of all of these stories, and we will feed into some of these stories. There's the business as usual story, and this is a very powerful story, and, and many governments like this story, because this story means we just carry on everything as we are, but we put the word green <laughs> in front of things, and we, we fiddle a little bit with something over here, and we might put some solar panels on some of our houses, but we just carry on with our growth economy, and we continue living as we are. Now, this story is very powerful because it makes us feel, oh, it's going to be okay. We don't need to change very much. We just carry on as we are and put a solar panel on the roof and carry on consuming and polluting and extracting. It will be fine. It's a powerful story because it feels easy. And as we're already starting to see, and as all of you wise souls on this call know, that's not going to be easy for much longer. It's not a convenient story. It is the problem story. The second story is a very powerful story that a lot of young people are feeding into. And it's a story called The Great Unraveling. And this story is the apocalyptic story. You know, we're doomed, it's too late, it's all unraveling, there's no hope, it's a, it's a crisis, I'm just gonna sit back and let it happen, there's nothing we can do. This story is very powerful, partly because our news feeds the symptoms that so all we're looking at is the symptoms of collapse, but also because we're really good at making apocalyptic movies. We're really good at making movies about the end of human civilization. And because we're so good at that, we can watch them and see that this is, see what this looks like. And so this is a powerful story because we can visualize it. Now, the story I, I spend my days living and the story that is the real story and the story that has been happening for 50, 100 years, much longer in human history, the story that is happening in your street, in your home, on your doorstep, in your community, in every corner of every part of the planet is the third story. It's the story of the great turning. It's the story of the millions of people who are out there working tirelessly to create the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. It's a story of active hope, the story of people doing something to create a healthier future. And that story is huge. And that story is real. But we do not tell that story. We do not tell that story anywhere near enough. And because those stories are not in our mainstream news, many people don't know that they exist. And the only stories that they get in the mainstream news are story one or story two. And so another revolution I would like to begin is a revolution of our media, which I know that's happening from many groups around the world, to start telling the third stories, start waking up every day and looking at all the things that are happening. So we know what we can do we know who is out there doing this, and we can help children to start to see and connect with all of the millions of change makers out there. So helping young people to take action in their own lives by sharing the stories of all of the people who are already doing it. So children do not think they have to do it all themselves. They simply connect to all of the people who are already making a change. 
So education in the time of a planetary emergency is not an add-on. It's not just something to put into a timetable. It's not just a lesson to add in in between French and maths and geography and music. It's a livelihood. It's knowledge, it's skills, it's practices, it's tools, it's values, it's competencies. And it really comes back to this question of how can we support healthy futures for people and planet? What sort of education do we need in a time of a climate emergency? We need an education that helps us to thrive. That's the bottom line. We need an education that helps us to thrive, not just survive. And it comes back down to culture. Now, some of you may be familiar with a very wonderful educator who sadly died recently, so called Sir Ken Robinson. He's got some wonderful TED Talks about transforming education. And he says this, successful schools don't focus on output, they focus on culture. In the same way that successful far sorry, sustainable farmers focus on the soil. If you get the culture right, everything else takes care of itself. And that means a culture of compassion, of collaboration, of care. So let's think for a moment about soil, the soil health. If we get the soil conditions right, if we get the soil healthy, everything we plant in that soil will naturally flourish. And the same in our schools. If we get that culture healthy, everything in that culture will naturally flourish. So creating a healthy culture is allowing us to reconnect to those elements we looked at at the beginning that we've disconnected from. It allows us to focus on a culture of care, a culture of self-care, of people care, and of earth care. A culture that allows us to care for and nurture ourselves and our own sense of personal well-being. A culture that allows us to nurture and care for each other a sense of social well-being and a culture that allows us to nurture and care for the rest of the natural world, earth care, to focus on environmental well-being. And I have to say, in all of the work that I do with all of the people I work with and meet, I come back to the same thing. If all of us in our lives just focused on three things, self-care, people care and earth care, that is all we need for a thriving future because that focus on the, that principal value of care, of, of supporting others and supporting that, that thriving is what human sort of evolution is all about, is coming back into balance. Now, I use the word regenerate, and Saka and David and I have recognized it doesn't translate into Hebrew. So I'm gonna look at different ways we can understand what regeneration is. But nature's wisdom shows us that if you create the conditions the soil, a healthy soil, the natural world just booms. Now, when we were all shut in our houses during the COVID pandemic, we probably saw how much nature reclaimed the streets, it reclaimed the land and it came back to life again. It's the same with people. If we can create the conditions, healthy conditions, we come back to life and we start to heal. So regenerate means to renew, or restore something, especially after it's been damaged or lost, and give it new life, to allow it to, to come back to life, to heal and to, to flourish. And nature shows us that the key to living, thriving ecosystems is to simply allow these healthy relationships to reform, healthy relationships with ourselves, healthy relationships with each other, and healthy relationships with the natural world. Now I'm going to really quickly go through this slide because my timing is terrible. I've just looked at the clock and I'm going to sort of move through a little bit faster so we can have time to talk. Um, but what I've been looking at recently, and I'll share some, um, some more work on this later, and I'm doing another webinar, a free webinar in September on this in a slow, slow pace, if any of you wish to come to that one. What we're looking at is that neuroscience proves what nature shows us. And I've been really interested in the neuroscience of well-being, the neuroscience of thriving. What do we need to thrive? What do children, human beings, no matter whether we're young or old, need to be well in the world? And the answer from whichever study of neuroscience you come back to is that to be well in the world, we need to be connected with ourselves, 
with each other and with the planet. And very quickly, five different strands of, of, of neuroscience, which I can share more information later. And as I said, I'm doing a seminar in, in September. We need to feel well in order to learn well, because the, the synapses in our brain that connect thinking and feeling are joined together. So if we do not feel well, we cannot learn well. And so it's terribly inconvenient for me to say this, but no children will do well at school if they're not feeling well first. And if we've got children coming to school feeling fearful, anxious, overwhelmed, they're not going to learn their algebraic equations. The second study in inter interpersonal neurobiology, humans have in our DNA this inherent need to connect. And if we're not connected, we do not function. Uh, and our physiological sort of capacities do not work if we're not connected with ourselves, with each other and the natural world. Caroline Hickman from the Climate Psychology Alliance recognizes that we need to feel safe, heard, connected and empowered to respond to the world. We need this sense of empowerment to feel well. The polyvagal theory, which is our deep nervous system, can help or hinder our capacity to be thriving and to be functioning. And we can have a nervous system that goes into collapse and puts us into apathy, or we can have a nervous system that is thriving and, and functioning. But again, we need those healthy relationships with ourselves, each other and the, the world around us to flourish. And we need to rebalance our brain. We're living in a divided brain where we've got far too focused on detail and not enough focus on trust and intuition. And what that's led to is again, a disconnection from our whole body intelligence. Now I've just gone through decades and decades of neuroscience in 45 seconds. And I appreciate that that's, that's not how to do it, but that's just a little touch to show that we're proving what nature shows us, what deep wisdom shows us, that for humans to be well, we need to connect. For social systems to be well, we need to connect. For planetary health to flourish, we need to connect. And we cannot solve the climate crisis if we're not as connected to our sense of personal well-being. If we're suffering from mental ill health, we do not have capacity to care about the health and well-being of the natural world. If we have fractured social systems where the cost of living is so high, we have no capacity to think about the climate crisis, we cannot support and, and respond to the, the, the problems of the natural world. So these three need to be supported together. We cannot learn well if we don't feel well. And we need to focus on reconnecting to ourselves, to each other, and to the natural world so that we start thriving. Now, what does that look like in our schools? I'm going to move to this next slide. It comes back to this framework of care, of self-care, of people care, of earth care. Now, we've been working for quite a few years on developing a framework, a whole school framework of what this looks like in practice, of some of the skills, the ideas, the behaviours, the mindsets to support us in this space to be bringing these ideas into schools on a regular basis. And the three words I come back to a lot in terms of the skills are thinking, feeling, and connecting. So thinking is encouraging critical thinking, feeling is encouraging empathy, and connecting is encouraging systems thinking, helping young people to understand how everything is in relationship with everything else. And we need to care for and support those relationships. Now, over the years, Thoughtbox has created um, a toolkit to help schools to start to bring these ideas into the school context and practice them. So we have a curriculum, we have some free programs and a paid curriculum for schools to start talking about the symptoms we're seeing across the world, but take children through a process of active hope so that we understand why our food systems are struggling. And we understand who is out there working to create positive futures for our food and what we can do to respond. The same thing with money, the same thing with um, homelessness, the same thing with inequality or immigration, to understand why the problem is happening, who is out there doing something about it and what we can do to respond. So I'll share at the end with Saka a, a whole list of resources that you can start to tap in if some of these are supportive for you. And we also run training programs for teachers to talk about a lot of this, to help understand how to move from surviving to thriving by bringing the practices of triple care into our own lives first 
then into our classrooms and then into our schools. And we're also now working with system leaders, which is why I'm so excited that we're connecting with all of you to show that as a system leader, we can help to create a culture of care in our system, which can ripple down into our teachers, into our students. And so please do reach out if you'd like to connect more with some of the work that we can support with. And we'd also like to be connecting with all of you to learn and listen to the work that you're doing in this space. But thinking about that culture of care, of self-care, of people care, of earth care, so that we can help young people in particular to move from anxiety to action by connecting them to all of the people out there doing things to support reconnection with ourselves, with each other and with the natural world. So that we understand we do not need to fix all of the problems, but if we focus on one area, so waste or social justice or fashion or in, uh, racial inequality, if we focus on one area, we're connecting still to other people who are focusing on other areas and that's bringing us all back together again. So we do not need to fix every single problem. We can focus on one area, but it's part of a bigger system and help young people to see all of the people in the world working in these systems so they can understand that there's people out there doing things, that, that story of hope. 